Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. In this lesson from Smart Edition Academy's ATI online course, we're going to review the chemical bonds. If you're already studying for the ATITs, you know that the science section will comprise of A and P, biology, and chemistry questions. Because of this, this video is actually part of our four-part series all about refreshing our knowledge on chemistry. So in this video, we're specifically going to go over what is bonding, three ways atoms can become stable, and the three different types of bonds. And at the end of the lesson, there's going to be a few practice test questions to test your knowledge, so stay tuned until the very end. Now, if you're coming from any biology lessons, this may seem like a review, but it's important to remember these concepts because atoms, or the elements of the periodic table, are the smallest element of matter, and therefore are essential to understanding chemical and biological concepts. This was exactly what Russian scientist Dmitry Mendeleev believed as well. As a chemist during the 19th century, Mendeleev noticed that when chemical elements were listed in order of increasing atomic weight, certain patterns and trends would display and could group specific elements based on their reactivity. This also allowed him to leave gaps within our periodic table to allow for the discovery of unknown elements that were predicted to exist based on the patterns he discovered. His studies make him the father of the periodic table. When we look at the modern periodic table, there are two noticeable trends that we can follow via the columns and rows. The columns, or groups as they are referred to, exhibit similar physical and chemical properties, but the table organizes the groups by the number of valence electrons in their outermost shell. The number of valence electrons of an atom are the most important factor in determining how an element will react because the outermost shell with the valence electrons is always seeking to fulfill the octet rule. What does that all mean? Let's look at the first column to understand. Group 1 of the periodic table, also known as the alkali metals, are highly reactive. Why? Well, remember that the number of valence electrons influences reactivity. So in this group of elements, there is one valence electron looking to participate in chemical bonding and fulfill the octet rule. Now, the octet rule states that atoms lose, gain, or share electrons to obtain a stable electron configuration of eight valence electrons hence octo for eight. So in other words, atoms are always looking to become stable by reacting with other elements by their valence electrons. Now these valence electrons can be found in the outermost shell or the location that electrons are found furthest away from the nucleus. And the periodic table is conveniently organized to represent those shells. Let's look at sodium. We already know that it's in the first group and has one valence electron but it's located in the third row of the table, and so that lone valence electron is actually found in the third energy level of the atom. Let's look at this other example, as seen previously as well. Magnesium is located here in the second column, so it has two valence electrons. But these two valence electrons can be found traveling the third energy level because it is in the third row. Now we've covered these simpler examples of elements that follow the octet rule, but just so we understand, Let's discuss some of the trickier groups. The periodic table is not a full table. Look at groups 3 through 12. These elements don't necessarily fill out the entire middle portion of the table. And the reason is that these elements are all grouped together in this way to continue following the periodic trend of listing each element in increasing atomic mass, but also because they have two valence electrons. This entire section here is considered the transition metals. Some common examples you might note are iron with its chemical symbol of Fe or silver with its chemical symbol Ag. So it's important to note that while the group numbers represent the number of valence electrons, these transition metals from groups 3 through 12 are considered to have two valence electrons for reactivity. But it's interesting how the organization of them is conveniently done. So when we move on to group 13, this group has three valence electrons and thus the pattern continues on. But if elements are always seeking to fulfill the octet rule, what happens when we get to the last group, group 18, where there are eight valence electrons? This group is considered the noble gases, which yes, have eight valence electrons already and are therefore considered stable. As a result, they don't need to react to become stable and are found in nature as single elements, rather than in compounds of combined elements. And yes, that still holds true for helium, Helium you might recognize as the gas that is commonly found in balloons. What's unique about helium is that it's located in the final group, group 18, 
but it actually does not have eight valence electrons. And that's why it's located at the very top of the noble gases column, in the same row as hydrogen. Hydrogen and helium, being located first and foremost in the first row, have their electrons stored in the first energy level. And when we look at the energy levels of an atom, the first energy level can only store two electrons. So by adhering to the octet rule, a full energy level for any element within the first row will need just two electrons. Helium has this, which is why it is considered a noble gas. Hydrogen does not, but to combine in a reaction is only seeking one electron to make it stable. It might be helpful to review this chart, which summarizes the reactivity of elements according to their group number. So let's recall magnesium. Sodium has one valence electron because it's in group one and will therefore need to lose one electron for reactivity. Now electrons carry a negative charge, so in the process of losing them, it would actually cause sodium's charge to be indicated as plus one. Now the relationships that these elements have when they gain, share, or lose electrons can be categorized depending on what they do. When electrons are transferred, atoms become ions, an atom with a net positive or negative charge. When an atom loses electrons, it becomes positively charged and defined as a cation. So in the case of magnesium, when it would lose electrons, a cation is being formed. This is different from, say, chlorine. Chlorine, located in group 17, has seven valence electrons in its third energy level. It needs one more to be considered stable. So when it gains one electron, its charge will become negative one and form what is considered an anion. Let's take this one step further. Imagine we are combining sodium and chloride. They are perfectly fit because sodium needs to lose an electron. Chlorine needs to gain one. In the process of transferring electrons to become stable, sodium chloride is created through an anionic bond. This makes sodium chloride an ionic compound. Some common ionic compounds are indicated here within this chart. But let's remember our other element we discussed earlier, magnesium. Located in group two, it has two valence electrons for reactivity, so it would likely lose electrons for an ionic charge of plus two. But if to say it combined with chlorine, which only needs to gain one electron, magnesium and chlorine would not be perfect pieces to a puzzle. So instead, magnesium would combine with two chlorine atoms to give up both of its electrons and stabilize two chlorine atoms, making the ionic compound formula MgCl2, the subscript of two indicating that there are two chlorine atoms for every one magnesium. This chart here provides other popular ionic compound formulas where multiple atoms are needed to stabilize. So what happens when atoms share electrons? Covalent bonds. Co, meaning together or jointly, makes it simple to remember. Let's look at this example here. Fluorine has seven valence electrons in its second energy level. So when two fluorine atoms combine, they share an electron to stabilize. This image here using the Bohr model of an atom, created from scientist Niels Bohr, shows how those electrons are shared and stabilize each of the fluorine atoms. An alternative view to this model is the Lewis structure. In this Lewis structure, atoms are represented by their chemical symbol, lines representing bonding, and dots represent lone pair electrons, or valence electrons, that are not involved with bonding. Let's look at hydrogen. Hydrogen is always a unique example in which it has one valence electron that it is likely to lose in a reaction to another element. Now hydrogen cannot simply lose this electron considering it's the only one, so it needs to covalently bond to other atoms to stabilize. Now we all know hydrogen is a part of water. Water is represented with the chemical formula H2O, in which two hydrogen atoms covalently bond to an oxygen atom. Now oxygen has six valence electrons in the second energy level. So we can see this from the diagram, how six electrons become shared amongst the hydrogen atoms to stabilize all three atoms within the molecule. But if we were to represent it with our Lewis dot structure, we see how each hydrogen atom is bonded, stabilizing oxygen, while oxygen has these four electrons, or four lone pairs of electrons. So when you see in a Lewis structure, each side of the chemical formula should be representative of two electrons, either with a lone pair or a bond of shared electrons. But bonds may be single, double, or even triple bonded. When we look at these Lewis structures here, we can see how if two oxygen molecules combine, there's a double bond. 
because each oxygen atom has a pair of lone electrons. They will actually share four in order to stabilize, creating a double bond. But let's continue with looking at water. Basic level biology introduces the concept of electronegativity, the tendency of an atom to attract shared electrons in a covalent bond. When two atoms share electrons equally, the bond is considered nonpolar covalent. When two atoms share unequally, the bond is considered polar covalent. So in our case of water, we know this to be a polar covalent bond because while the electrons are being shared, they're unequally shared since electronegativity varies amongst the atoms and one side of the molecule is more positive than the other. So to recap, the periodic table displays naturally occurring elements in a way that not only places them in increasing atomic mass order, but displays certain trends and patterns. Most notably, the columns of a periodic table are indicating of how many valence electrons the element has in its outermost shell, and the energy level is indicated by the row the element is found on. Atoms will react to either gain, lose, or share electrons in order to fulfill the octet rule and become more stable. When they gain or lose electrons, atoms become ions, and more specifically cations when they are positively charged from having lost electrons, which naturally carry a negative charge, or anions when they become negatively charged from gaining electrons. When elements combine together to do this, they are forming ionic compounds. Covalent compounds are when atoms share electrons and may create single, double, or triple bonds to stabilize. Atoms will share electrons, but while they stabilize each other by filling out their outermost energy level, the electrons may not be shared equally and will create electronegativity, which may result in polar covalent bonds. If atoms are sharing the electrons equally, they will be considered nonpolar.